I'd like to introduce our final speaker of the day, Scott Trailer. You have to love his title. He's a CEO and chief kid. <laughs> 4360 Kid. Uh, Scott is in the forefront of digital marketing place in both product development and customer relations. And this afternoon he's going to lead the discussion on how to make social media work for you or how not to be anti-social in social media. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I like I, that. I, we're using that as a title, I think, in our That's perfect. CIC. I, think, I think that would be great. Great. Wonderful. Well, but thank you, Joanne. Thank you all for coming, and uh, it's nice to meet some of you in advance, and I look forward to meeting the rest of you uh, afterwards. As Joanne mentioned, my name is Scott Trailer, and I run a company called 360 Kid. It is currently in its 24th year, if you can believe that. It's uh, recently been relocated to the Silicon Valley area, uh, having been in Boston most of the time prior. And in my history, you know, I've been involved in a, a lot of informal consumer learning products as well as formal classroom products. I'm a former computer science educator. I am fascinated by all things uh, social media. I've been a member with uh, the AAP since uh, the AEP AAP merger. I was on the board of the AEP. I'm also on the board of a number of other educational organizations. I thought it might be interesting to start with a handful of stories. And I've also brought a number of interesting examples in social media that I've noted and somewhat of an industry overview in the publishing world of who's doing what in social media. But as I've shared with a couple of folks before, that I have a lot of stories that's off deck. You know, a lot of things that aren't crammed into my presentation that hopefully would be uh, very informative and helpful to hear. So anyway, let me start by saying these are a, a handful of areas that I will look to cover to begin with. A few social media stories, data on teachers in social media, data on publishers in social media, and tips, do's and don'ts. Let me ask before we move on, how many folks are marketers? here. Oh, wow, just about, well, all right, it's a marketing crowd, okay. <laughs> educators or former educators, all right, great. And anyone outside of the L.A. or Huntington Beach area? Okay, yeah, all right, <laughs> wonderful. Let me start with a small number of stories that my journey in getting involved in social media. And I think in the earlier days, it was really about blogging before Twitter and LinkedIn and so forth. I've been a, a long-term blogger, but I often say that I have more blog guilt than blog posts. And I think if you're responsible for writing, you know what that means. It's like, oh my God, I got to get something going. And I, I had a very simple rule when I got started, just one post a month to see what would happen. I, I do believe that is far from enough. That is not the right amount to get any kind of visibility or traction or, or user engagement. But I would often write about the comings and goings in the education world, usually from a technology perspective. What's going on with whiteboards or tablets or uh, uh, access to different technology products in the classroom, <laughs> some that have succeeded, some that have failed. But occasionally I'd offer something a little off the beaten path. And this first example is a blog post I made of, well, what do you do with these 3D glasses when you're done with them? And so for fun, I put together some little craft activity. There's a picture of me and, and some of my family members there, and I keep an idea journal, and I've often thought about just making a blog post of just that, like I post an idea a day. I won't live forever to see them all produced, so why not just give them away? This was fun, and I, I got a big kick out of it, and... My friends did too. It didn't really get a lot of traction as a blog post. Until about a month later when a popular social media website called Laughing Squid picked it up. And in fact, somebody had warned me that this article found their way into the editorial team at Laughing Squid and to be prepared for the traffic. Now, it wasn't that much traffic, but I was pretty surprised when looking at my metrics. You know, in one day I had about... 5,000 uniques, and that was on my site. My article on their site was, I'm going to guess, is probably you know, uh, 10 times to 15 times the traffic. So it was a good day. But I also was very frustrated about like, but what about my whiteboard article? Why isn't anybody reading that? And I was really very mixed. You know, the things that I care about and I'm passionate about don't often get the traction that I want. But the eclectic, silly ideas tend to move the needle. 
That's just one story. And I'm working my way up from small success to bigger success in the social media space. I was a very early user in LinkedIn, and LinkedIn has changed significantly enough that I can't find the actual materials online in the LinkedIn service that I wanted to share. Somebody had a blog post that I copied where they used to have questions and answers forums, and they kind of do still with groups, but it wasn't, you know, years ago it was different. Where if you had a question like HTML5, yes or no, and then you get (laughs) hundreds of people responding to that from very diverse communities. I was looking for an engineer at the time in the ed tech space and was cruising around and I found some thread that said, hey, anybody know of any specialists in the children's space that maybe they were an educator or not? We have an idea for a project. I responded by saying, yeah, that would be me. And there was maybe, I don't know, 20 other people who posted around the country. About two days later, after posting that, I got a call saying, hey, we've been interviewing a lot of people for a very large new project. Behind the scenes, it looks like everything that you're doing is a great fit for our vision. Would you like to develop this online product for us? I said, sure. And within about three weeks, I had closed a quarter million dollar deal just by answering a question on LinkedIn. I imagine maybe, like you, for those of you who use LinkedIn, you may ask yourself, what am I doing here? Why am I wasting my time? Will this ever amount to anything? And I remember for the first year, maybe the first year and a half, you know, and you go like, oh gosh, I don't even have more than 50 connections. I must be a loser. But uh, after a while, um, I found out that you stick with it, sometimes some pretty surprising things happen. And that was the best example to date on LinkedIn for me of making a deal. And I've heard other similar stories in telling this story, but it took a lot of patience in waiting to get there. This next story is a sad story to begin with and then an interesting kind of case study in social media. Last summer, the Korean Airlines jet that crashed at San Francisco, I was getting on a plane to go to the East Coast. I was with my family and we were like, oh, we got 10 minutes to get on the plane before we're stuck on there for seven hours. Let's get something to eat. And I go to get something to eat at a little bagel place at the international end of uh, JetBlue at SFO. And I look out the window and I see this. I'm also a video blogger. I have on my YouTube channel, I have close to about 480 videos, mostly of people talking heads in the industry, sometimes ed tech, sometimes toy tech, oftentimes a lot of product reviews. And it was started just very informal, hoping that keeping that information out there would help all boats rise. So I travel with a video camera all the time. And as I'm ordering my bagel and I look out the window and I see this and Mind you, I had no idea what was going on. When you come in and out of Logan Airport at Boston, which is where I was going at the time, at the end of the runway, they have a a, a little um, practice drill area where they sometimes set a structure on fire as a drill. And I figured that's what this was. And then I said, just in case it's not, let me get out my camera. I videotaped it. After I shot about 30 seconds of it, I'm getting ready to get on the plane, and I go like, well, what good is this? If this is something, maybe I should post it. So within 10 minutes, I had taken that 30-second clip and uploaded it to my YouTube channel. Here it is, my YouTube channel. Then right after that, I posted a tweet to my Twitter account that looked like this. Plane appears to be on fire here at SFO. This was posted within 12 minutes after the crash. My video, I looked at the date stamp, was shot a minute and 25 seconds after the crash. And in my post on YouTube, I wrote, you can kind of see it down at the bottom here. Uh, This is from, carried over from YouTube. I said, do not repost on YouTube because a lot of people were pirating this immediately. But I said, if you're a news outlet, go ahead and feel free to use it, but just make sure you use this credit. Within about one minute, my phone started ringing off the hook. I received about, I don't know, maybe 100 Twitter replies within about 10 minutes. And then I got a call from the CBC in Toronto, the BBC in the UK, and ABC Australia, all within the course of about 20 minutes. I still don't know a plane has crashed. And I started doing an interview with one channel and realized, this is wrong of me to speak about this. I have, they were telling me stuff that I had no idea was going on around me. But yet I captured the moment and thankfully had the insight to do something with it quickly. Here are the metrics in the first three days after posting that video. In the first day, I almost reached 1.2 million views, 
which is pretty unbelievable for anyone to post something on YouTube. It, my second best video that I ever shot was of a Disney Cars plastic toy that got a half a million views within a month. I have no idea why. I was like, I was going to throw it away. Why would anybody care about this toy? But over the history of this video uh, being posted, it's close now to about six million views, you know, a year and a half later. Um, it's just hovering just under six million. My overall YouTube channel has just under 12 million views and I think it's 2,800 2, subscribers. And I probably should mention this about the subscribers now and I could mention it about other platforms as well. I learned a tip from some really good video bloggers that when you get about 10,000 subscribers on your channel and it's an ad revenue generating channel, you make enough money as a full-time minimum wage job just by letting the ads play and the money and the checks come in from Google. So that was... No, well, it, you know, another thing I'm going to tell you later on is being prepared. Okay. When I posted this video, I was not prepared at all. And what does being prepared mean in social media? And, and I think it means to take advantage of the opportunity to try to flow the, the, the traffic somewhere to some initiative that you have. And at that time, it was such an afterthought, I, I was not prepared. And not only was I not prepared with what I would do with the traffic, I mean, the most prepared I was was just saying, let news outlets have it for free. <coughs> I had a problem with my account about getting ad revenues working correctly. So I had, through friends in Silicon Valley, I said, I need somebody to talk to at YouTube. And trying to get, for anyone to do that is next to impossible. So about three months into the, trying to find somebody, I found somebody. And it was the day before I posted this video. And in speaking with them, they said, this is going to take a few days for this to work itself out, but we'll get your account working, you'll generate revenue, and then you'll be fine. And then I posted the, the video, and I got, um, I, think, I think we need to solve this faster. I think so, we got to figure this out. And it didn't get solved for a week after I posted this video, and I, just, I had done the math, and I had figured I lost about $12,000 in ad revenue between the time I posted it and the time they fixed my account because it was just, the traffic was so fantastic. Anyway, just a, just a few stories. And note, none of these relate to what I'm trying to accomplish as a business how I'm trying to move the needle in ed tech. But knowing that I've had sometimes these, these fleeting successes, I keep thinking about how am I going to use that the next time it happens? How can I direct that towards the next big <coughs> project I'm working on or, or campaign to make a awareness of, of some new whatever in the classroom space? And I'll return to this theme about the serendipity of, um, of social media. Anyway, let me move into data on teachers and social media. The good news is there is some data out there that's very helpful. And no, I'm thinking about how do we reach teachers from a, a publishing perspective. Maybe it's workbooks, maybe it's some online tool, whatever it is that your target audience is K-12 teachers and you'd like to introduce them to your products or your services to use in the classroom. The upside, as I mentioned, is that there is some data out there about teachers and social media. The downside is, it's like I haven't seen anything really new for about 14, 16 months. So everything is late 2013, mid-2013, sometime around there. One interesting report that came out recently by uh, the Gates Foundation, what teachers know best about technology, they asked the question within this report, and it's all about how teachers discover tech products, how they use them in the classroom, what do they look for, what are the purchasing chain of commands. I think this came out in April this year. So question here is, well, what do we know about how teachers and districts select and purchase digital instructional tools? Teachers said they find out about products primarily by word of mouth from other teachers and administrators, number one. Number two, at professional meetings, get-togethers, conferences, and number three is the biggie for me, through online, via search engines, and social media. Huh, what about that um, catalog? <laughs> what about the boots on the ground? You know, the, uh, the salespeople, door to door, practically. And I hear this anecdotally through parents that are interested in finding out what are the best educational apps for their children. Who do they ask? They ask teachers. Who do teachers ask? They ask each other. How do they ask it? Well, if they're not face-to-face, -face, they're probably part of some social group, online or off, and that's how they're learning about new products, I think, to a very large extent. And 
it's more of an intuition at the moment because I don't have the data really to back it up. There's a Pew Internet study looking at teachers and how they use technology to communicate. The, the interesting thing here, I've got three charts out of this report, and this was from mid-2013. First thing, uh, t teachers are heavy users of uh, the Internet and for information, for seeking out information. And in the report they say, above and beyond the general population in the U.S. or any other adult outside of the teaching industry, which I never knew before. It's like, wow, that's pretty powerful. Teachers are active in trying to find the right information they need. So uh, it also talks a lot about, here it is, 99% of all teachers use search engines. Well, it's no surprise. Well, what else are they doing besides just search engines? Here it is, teachers using social networks to find information about new products. 78% of all teachers. And how many of them use Twitter? It's 26%. Now, that's not a large amount, in my opinion, 26%, but it's more than I originally thought. And I think the savvy ones that are staying on the cutting edge about new product that could be brought into the classroom are found right here. That's what my gut is telling me. This is who's using social media by teacher age, by uh, how many years they've been teaching, male or female, what grade level, and what subject. And as you look at the numbers, teachers that are younger are using social media more to find out about new product that, compared to older teachers. Well, that's not that big a surprise, but the lowest number is 68% of teachers over 55 are using social media. Or 19%, this last column is Twitter. So here it says 22 to 34 year olds, 30% of them are using Twitter to find new product. While this, I think this is a really great snapshot, sadly, you know, from a year ago, what I want to see, and, and we'll talk about a little bit, is Pinterest. Because I think that teachers are flocking to Pinterest to find new product faster than going to Twitter right now. But there's no data to support it. No research firm has done much about it. But my instincts are telling me, if you do K6, you want to be an active Pinterest user. Really active. There is this one other chart from um, Ellen uh, Bialo of uh, IESD, where she, one of her reports last year looked at how do teachers find information about apps, educational apps. And so this is not a perfect fit. You know, it's very specific to apps instead of general to instructional technology. And the number one thing here is Twitter is used as the common way of finding it. Almost 57% of teachers use Twitter to find new product. And after that, Facebook, Edmodo, YouTube, TeacherTube, EdWeb, some of the usual suspects. But who would have guessed Twitter would have been that high? I would love to see Ellen update this to include Pinterest because I, I, my gut is telling me it's above Twitter. It's just taking off so quickly. Now, you're in for a treat, my own data. I don't share a lot of my data that often. And it's not because I don't want to, it's just, I'm just, I get busy. I'm not a, a data researcher, but I like dabbling in social media tools to try to see what neat trends I could find on my own. So I created a, um, a Twitter analytics tool that I use at a lot of different conferences throughout the year, just for my own information. And I turned it to FETC from last year. And I think it was January 28th to January 31st, right? I think it was four days. And there were 8,500 attendees, and I had this information verified from uh, 1105 Media. I said, hey, I got something I think you'd be interested in. And they said, okay, if you do, here, let me share. And this was a breakdown of people at the event. 20% uh, administrators, superintendents, principals, 35% IT directors, 22% educators, 20% instructional support people. And then I did a count. There were 426 vendors that was separate from all that. I followed the tweet stream on Twitter related to FETC very closely and have an archive of many more than 10,000 tweets. There was a major spammer that was taking advantage of the trending nature of FETC at the time and were sending all these terrible, awful email messages that, that took me probably a day to strip out of the data. But of those almost 10,000 tweets, this is the data that I was able to glean from that. And I spent a lot of time looking at all the vendor names, looking at individual Twitter names, and trying to tie it back to the conference. And what I found out was 33% of all vendors, all booth vendors, were tweeting, which amounted to about 18% of all the traffic. So that means 18% of the information, or the noise, was coming from somebody trying to sell something on the show floor at FETC where I also figured out about 20% of all of the tweets that were not from vendors were coming from within the conference. That meant that 62% of the tweets were coming from outside the conference, roughly. And so who are those people? 
educators seeking out a new product who can't make it to Florida, who, do, who don't have the budget, they're not on school break, but they don't want to miss whatever the news is. And there's a lot of other interesting information here about the long tail. Many people would just chime in and, and tweet once or twice with a, a message or retweet somebody else's post. And there were those Uber users, those who were really hardcore, and they tended to be vendors. And they were very much a push message. Hey, come look at us. Hey, aren't we awesome? We got a new thing. Or it would be like, hey, we're giving away an iPad. Come on down. Uh, you know, we're taking business cards. And Microsoft had some big deal going on there, too, and I think um, another tablet manufacturer. But I thought this was fascinating. These, these statistics, I find almost any educational conference, like FETC or larger, tends to have about 10,000 tweets or more. I had tracked ISTE a couple of years in a row, and it, the data is just so massive, it's really hard to capture. It's on the order of like 65,000 tweets over the course of ISTE. If those percentages are the same, I ask you, is it worth spending your time from a marketing perspective using Twitter? Probably. Just a guess. This is only the data that I've been able to put together on my own. There are some social media tools that I can't back into numbers like this. Like Facebook is a really hard one to back into. What are the metrics? Who's on it? Who's not? Why? And Pinterest is the same way as well. Let me move on to some... Yes, Yes. That's a very good question. I haven't been able to find, although um, I think Ellen's information has a district leader and superintendents in it, but the, uh, the Gates Foundation and the Pew Internet folks don't have administrators or principals in there. Do they not have them in there or they're just not separating them out? From their I team suspect team? they're just not separated out. I think that might just be, in the, I think it's probably in the larger data set. I can't see why they wouldn't have it. But, you know, sometimes the way these reports get funded, it may be from the perspective of a teacher, and so the, the, the people doing the analysis are uh, little blinders are on, and they're not really thinking about the other important people at the party. Okay, was that interesting so far? Okay, hopefully this one is for you, because it's a little bit closer to home. I just pulled some members from the AAP learning group. This is a handful of publishers, I'll just run down the list. It's Capstone, Compass Learning, Davis Publications, Houghton Mifflin, K-12, Learning A to Z, Learning.com, McGraw-Hill, Pearson, Rosen Publishing, Scholastic, Teacher Creative Materials, and Teaching Strategies. And I pulled Brain Pop and Scholastic out separately, and I'll tell you why in a moment. This is not as up-to-date as it could be, but it's a good overview of going to each one of these companies' websites. What social media tools are they promoting on the first page? All of them have Facebook. All of them have Twitter. Some of them, a little less than half, have a YouTube channel and even smaller half a uh, uh, Pinterest, and then LinkedIn, and then there's a bunch of others, you know, Google Plus. This, this may have increased, but I question why, because I'm not quite sure how many teachers are really there. And then lesser familiar tools, although uh, Tumblr, I think, is one to watch, you know, from a blogging or an image sharing perspective. Anyway, the interesting thing here is that I think there are assumptions about what many of these publishers believe is important to have in place to have a conversation with their purchasers or with teachers or administrators or superintendents. I don't think that many people who are using these social media tools really know how best to use them. When I analyze the tweet stream of any of these publishers, some of them just go on and on and on about their products and nothing else. And the wise ones, whether within this group or other industries, I find, are always asking questions of the people they're speaking with and saying thank you. And that's not magic. That's just courtesy. Because working with any of these social media tools, well, most of them, it's a two-way conversation. It's not necessarily push, 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 me, me, me. It's like, oh, let me listen to you. Let me hear what you're saying. Let me acknowledge what you're saying. Let me thank you for what you're saying. When you aggregate like Scholastic's Twitter stream or even their fa Facebook account and just look at all the words they use, the one word I always look for is to see how often they say thank you. Because I think that says a lot about the success of their campaign and thinking about the end user. Again, my two cents, my gut from watching other people's accounts. A simple, very effective thing. But other than that, let me say, I separated out Brain Pop and Scholastic. Brain Pop and Scholastic do not promote their social media tools on their lead page. Everyone else above does. 
Uh, the funny thing I find is that if you wanted to find out Brain Pop's Facebook page or Scholastic's Twitter account, you have to search for it. It's really buried. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but if somebody comes to your lead page to try to start a conversation with you, I don't think you want to lose them. And that doesn't mean that on your lead page you need all of this. I really question some of those platforms. But if you have a specific reason why it might benefit your product or, or communicating with your audience, it's worth exploring. Okay, now sometimes I get a little overboard with my data. This is just how these publishers use Twitter in 2014 and 2015, year to date. So what you see here is who has the most followers on Twitter? Discovery Education. Scholastic is second in 2014, January 2014. January 2015, you can see how much their followers grew over the year. You can also see how many people they follow. And notice, Discovery doesn't, they didn't follow that many more people in the last year. And that's not uncommon. You know, that happens. Some people have a strategy. Well, for every person that follows me, I'll follow them back. I, I, I question whether there's a, a real benefit to that or not. And then you can see, well, how many tweets did they make in January of last year? 210? How about this year? Almost 350. My message here is not that more is better. My message is quality is more important than quantity. And these numbers can be misleading, but if, if Scholastic now has almost 125,000 followers on Twitter and they want to make a new product announcement, where are they going to share it? Who are their biggest supporters? Who are their biggest fans? One might suspect the followers of any of these publishers are fans. There could be some competitors in there as well, granted. And it's about thinking about how can you benefit those fans, those people who could help spread the word because teachers share information by word of mouth. How can you get that information into their hands? That's right. Mm -hmm. There is a frustration among many with the analytic tools that are available. I mean, there's some real low-end ones like Hootsuite, but it doesn't really capture everything. And I find that there are a number of fly-by-night startups that create some really dynamite Twitter analytics tools that basically get shut down by Twitter. And there's a reason why I would love to open a Twitter business, an analytics business. The difference between Facebook and Twitter is that when you post something on Facebook, you know who owns it? Facebook. Facebook's data. That photo of your three-year-old nephew blowing out candles, Facebook owns it, technically. But they're not pursuing you for the copyright. But if you read the fine print, that's what it says in the terms of service. The difference between Facebook and Twitter is Twitter says, you are the owner of all of your data. We are not. We don't care. Enjoy. The problem is when a company says, like, I'm going to build a tool that really helps people find the data they need about sales and ROI through Twitter, you have to collect tweets that don't belong to you. So Twitter shuts a lot of those businesses down or quietly acquires them and folds their tech into their service. And oftentimes to get really great data, you need a computer scientist and somebody who understands Python and know someone who knows how to crawl through data. And that's like usually the only way you can get what you want, like truly great data. All the other tools I find might get you in the ballpark. It's real general, but it's not the real meaty specific stuff that you want. I hope the data doesn't bore you. I get excited by it. Okay. So, um, and I have a bunch of others too. I only brought a few things today. I, uh, I have many, many more about other tools and everything. Uh, in fact, I did, this, uh, I did this report once for a PBS. I like PBS for PBS Kids and their educational initiatives. And they have one YouTube channel. And on that YouTube channel is over 3,000 videos, uh, frontline clips, as well as Curious George. They're all on the same channel. The funny little secret is YouTube only shows 1,200 of those last 3,000 videos at a time. So all the things that are older, nobody can find them by searching for them. And a kid can't find the Curious George thing from seven years ago. So why do they have all that built into one channel? And their argument is 
because of privacy rights for children using YouTube under the age of 13, which is the correct way of handling it legally. Where Disney has like eight channels, some of them are Hispanic, some of them are UK, some of them are junior, some of them are for older teens, and they're thriving like crazy and they cross promote. And they occasionally, this is great when you catch it, you can see that they'll place links within their video at the end of a video that leads to some new promotion they have going on and they update those links. And PBS is not doing that. And I'm not, again, not trying to throw stones. This is just a good example of how two different successful companies use social media through YouTube to engage their audiences. And on that point, I, I suspect that that's probably going to change for PBS because Google, I, as you probably heard, you know, they're starting to think about creating an alternative universe of tools and software and YouTube experience for those under the age of 13 to better handle the privacy rights of COPA and FERPA and all that stuff. Okay, here's another screen of data. This is just Facebook likes. And I also have other data about when they started and how many posts do they do in a month and all kinds of other stuff. And Scholastic is pretty darn big. And what's funny is Discovery is further on down. Remember, Discovery is at the top of the list on Twitter. But anyway, so just kind of a, a smattering of all different publishers and how they're thinking about it. And again, the bigger the number does not mean better. It's really about quality. What did I find that was really pretty interesting here? Oh, is it on the other screen? Like, if you don't have original content to tweet, tweet something else of someone else's that is relevant to your audience. Anyway, you know what's interesting here? Like, K-12, they post, oh my God, they must post something like 12 items a day to their channel. And I didn't verify this this month, but I remember every time I keep looking back, like I can't even find the materials they posted yesterday because there's so much stuff posted on their Facebook feed. And I ask, okay, is that helpful for them or not? I mean, is that the quality or is that the quantity? I can't really tell. I'll leave it up for you to check it out. But that's something that I've noted about them. And with Scholastic's message, just because they have a consumer division and they have a television division, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on there instead of just nice and clean education. I'm going to move into some do's and don'ts. I'm going to start with the don'ts, because that list is a little smaller. I live by this phrase, me, me, me is dull, dull, dull. <laughs> and I think in social media, if all you do is talk about yourself, that's a surefire way to turn a lot of people off. Keep that in mind. This doesn't need to be stated, but don't be controversial. It's funny how I hear of other people in charge of social media campaigns for education companies and how they handle Common Core, or how they handle adoptions or how they handle budget cuts within the state. And it's really like kid gloves. Don't anger your base. Ask a question. Well, what is it that makes you upset? You know, engage them. And you will find, at some, I have seen flame wars between people you know, who have one extreme position and someone else has another extreme position, but they both love your product. Sometimes you have to manage that delicately and you might ask them to tone it down because that's not fair for the rest of your followers. Related to that point, I've seen a really interesting trend in the informal learning space. A number of players, and they usually have some kind of robotics product or a programming in robotics or an app, those informal education groups are starting to form, uh, they're, they're hiring people in charge of community to help grow an online base of fans of the product that will share information with each other. And you know, they're usually called community experts, or community managers. And I've seen a couple of really smart and really young publishers start to do the same. And I wonder if, in our conversation, you know, we're talking about who's in charge of the social media. I might argue, well, who's in charge of the community support? Because community can mean social media, but also a whole lot of other things. I suspect that might be a trend we would see in the years ahead. Instead of calling customer service, let's talk to the community manager. What does he, she have to say? Yes. When I say informal learning, I mean, you know, like leapfrog learning products, for example. You know, they... Crossover consumer. It's usually a consumer angle. You can buy fake subscribers and fake numbers. I don't think it's worth it. I think it's a big mistake. And some people are like, well, my numbers are so small, I could get 60,000, you know, overnight. I wouldn't go there. It's, it's, it should be self-evident. I, I think it's a real disservice to your company if you do that. Do not copy and paste between platforms. This is a harder one. So let's say you're going to make an announcement on LinkedIn, and you want to make that same announcement on Twitter and the same announcement on Facebook. There's really no added value about each of those platforms in your message. Think about custom crafting a message that is unique for each one of those platforms. It may have a similar endpoint, 
but don't treat it as the same material across all platforms. And sometimes stagger it. Don't announce it all at once. You know, create a plan, a schedule about when you make your updates on one platform versus another versus another. And what is the unique message that may lead back to your overarching goal in using social media. Okay, I will now go into the do's. Thankfully, the don'ts are pretty apparent. But the do's are almost equally difficult to, to really stay on top of. For, I think the biggest and most important thing in running a successful social media campaign is listening. And right after that is asking questions. Those two things alone, with the addition of saying thank you, will go a really long way. Have a genuine voice. This is a hard thing when you're hiring somebody to manage your, your social media presence. You need somebody who knows the products inside out. Somebody who's a passionate educator and passionate for your business. And I think if you hire somebody that is not passionate, it comes through. And I think the users on the other end know it. So this is why I say you have to be careful in who you hand this baby over to. Participate and be courteous. It's a two-way conversation, not a one-way push. Be consistent and stay with it. It's important not to do it once a week. And, you know, like my LinkedIn story and getting a very large business deal out of it, I stayed with it for a year and a half before that happened, not knowing where it was going to go. And I think that same kind of patience and also enduring through the unknown of it is important. It's really hard to get a specific ROI dollar value. And I sometimes share, well, when you talk to your marketing person, they're going to go to conferences and they're going to take people out to dinner and they're going to put ads in Ed Week or whatever. You know there's a dollar value with somewhat of an expected outcome. Whereas in social media, it's really hard to say, well, I'm putting all this money here. What's coming back? Well, one would argue fans of your product. And how do you put a number on that? That's really hard. But don't you want more passionate people about your product? That's invaluable. I mean, you can't pay enough money to get those people. So I argue it's a, a wise investment if done correctly. I'll move on a little more here. Stay balanced. Again, it's not being controversial with different voices that follow you. Share, be a resource. I think this is a good formula uh, to um, you know, encountering the me, 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 dull, dull, dull. I've heard some um, very talented social media people say, I only post about my company and my product 20% of the time. The other 80% of the time, something else that might be of interest to them. A conference, a research paper, a funny video. And then, you know, so that way I think that's a really nice balance without offending and being over-promotional through your social media tools. Again, quality over quantity. It's not about the numbers. I've also heard some other good advice. The really talented social media people that I know try to post something every two to four hours. And sometimes that's scheduled, and sometimes it's not. Of course, I'm, I'm sure they're not waking up in the middle of the night to do anything about it, but I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good number. Work from a schedule. Think about the keywords in the SEO. From a blog perspective, you know, you can run your blog article through an online SEO tool like I think Google offers one and you can find your keywords that might rank higher. Theoretically, you could probably do that with a tweet or the copy uh, in, in other social media platforms. Say thank you. Keep your metrics. Mark it down. Note what you did every day. Note the outcome at the end of the week. Start paying attention to the trends. Is Monday a better day than a Wednesday? Is Saturday even worth doing? Is it better to do 7 p.m. Eastern because I can still catch the West Coast? These are the things you need to think about. Be prepared for success. You won't know when it'll happen if you stay with it, but it will happen, and it will catch you off guard when it finally hits. And uh, the last one is just be patient because it does take an awfully long time to, to grow a real successful social media presence. But one, I might argue, is really invaluable for the future of your company, for the changing nature of marketing, and to really grow a very loyal and loving fan base uh, for your company. So that's the formal stuff. And then there's my contact info. Well, thank you.